The sponge is in the ocean. Your, your body is within God. Mm -hmm. But the ocean is also in the sponge. Right. Okay? And so now, but as long as you pretend that you are the Born sponge, the sponge. Mm -hmm. you will forget that you're the ocean. As long as you're focusing on the sponge, you see, thinking that you're this body and its yeah. thoughts, then you in that instant will forget that you are really the ocean. And so that's why I say, you are always yourself, you're always the ocean. You may forget that you're the ocean and just keep thinking you're the sponge because you're focusing on the sponge. But, and you don't have to try to really think about the ocean. You already are the ocean. You can never not be God. All that's necessary is to cease identifying with the thought that I am this body. Or let go of the me thought. The individual separate sense of me. As soon as you disidentify with I am a person, I am the body, as soon as you move beyond that, you fall into the ocean. Your attention resorts or defaults back to the ocean, you see. But what ends up happening first is that, you see, and this is where it starts to get a little more sophisticated, is that when you believe that you're the sponge, when you think you're the sponge, the easiest way to keep you lost in the world of forms is to get you to while you're even inside of the sponge, focusing on other sponges. Yeah. So now, and, and other fish, and other, you know, things, all different distractions that are out there. And notice what that does. That just peripherates the mind. Okay? It just peripherates it. The whole thing, it just begins to divide and split and split and split into... You see, endless forms. Now, why is the self-inquiry so powerful? Because it immediately, no matter how many times there are splits out there, no matter how many millions of splits there are, it brings you back to before the split ever occurred. Who's aware of that? I am. Now you become aware of I, and you're back in the ocean. Mm. See how instantaneous? You, it doesn't take lifetime after lifetime. You don't have to stand on your head. You don't have to meditate on, you know, a, a candle flame. You don't have to, you know, go through all these different spiritual processes, you know, workshops on how to, like, get rid of all of your depression and your sadness and all this kind of thing. Not necessary. All you have to do is find the source. Who is aware of all of it? Who's aware of this room right now? See, right now, while you're looking at me, if you bring your attention to you, does this make sense? What is this? Okay. If you are, let's just say, if you're looking at me now, but while you're looking at me, allow your attention to come back toward yourself. So you're seeing me, but at the same time, you're feeling yourself. like a double-headed arrow. One is pointing that way, so you're sensing, you're seeing that, but you're also feeling your own existence. Mm -hmm. Okay, now try to stay with that as long as you can, with your attention inward. Okay, and watch, feel the pull, feel the tendency of the mind to want to just forget about that and go out. Mm -hmm. You see that? Because very shortly, it's it's, you know, the mind will forget. Then you'll have to remind yourself again, oh, who's aware of that? I am. Now you're back aware. You see, now what ends up happening is because the pull is so tenacious, it's so strong going outward because we've been doing that for so long, it's necessary to reverse the conditioning, the habit of going outward and replace that with a thought going inward. In other words, you're taking it, it's like it's like a bunch of wires pointing this way. You're just taking those wires and you're bending it in this way. You're taking another wire, you're bending it this way. Before you know it, the whole strand of wire, the whole, you see, 
rebar, whatever you want to call it, is now bent back and pointing back to yourself, to where there's no more pointing out toward the world. And once you realize that you're the ocean, you see, then you can play with the sponge, but you'll realize that that's not who you are. You see, it must, it must, however, take place, you see, on the level of turning the mind inward. You cannot give your attention outward and realize who you are. That's just not going to work. It's, it's necessary in order to give attention to God. That's why seek first the kingdom of God. See, and who, what is God? I am. And so, where is I am felt? Where is the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven? Within you. So, the term, now, that's actually not true. Because there's really no you unless there's other than you. Because it's really all you, right? But you don't know that. You can't really know that until you turn within to the heart. And once you move into the heart, then now you've disidentified with the sponge. And now you're in the water within the sponge, right? And then you can become aware of the sponge. But not until you've disidentified with it as being who you are. Does that make sense? It's kind of a, you know, the main thing is that, you know, realize that right now, if you really get it, that if you really tune in to inside of you, that your body is really just a, an image, you can actually, if you can feel the aliveness within your body, just feel the aliveness. You're the awareness, that aliveness that's within the body. You're not the body. You're that aliveness, the awareness that makes the body appear solid. And that's the I am that gives. <sighs> the I am is as close as we can get. You mm -hmm. see, intentionally, to that. You see, to the sense of self, to the true self. You see, because you can't really give attention to something that has no form. You can be that, but you can't really look at it. The only way to be the self, or to realize the self, is to be the self. And the only way to be the self is to, or the only way to be the ocean, is to disidentify with the sponge. You see, you then, once you've disidentified with the sponge, you don't have to try to think of the ocean. See you'll naturally fall right in to the ocean once you've let go of the sponge. Because there's nothing else. Do we, do we see this? Now, I use this metaphor because it is, in a sense, very challenging for, you see, the mind to grasp this because it's conditioning as such to go toward the sponge, toward the other sponges for so long. Mm -hmm. The more sponges, the more forms that you identify with, that you become attached to, you see, then the more challenging it is to actually turn within your sponge. Most people, most sponges, have not brought their attention back to their sponge yet. They're too busy focusing on only getting, accumulating other sponges, other objects, people, places things, events, acquiring memories, thoughts, desires, fulfilling, going after and chasing after things in the world. You see. And these are, there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Just 
you know, it's important to recognize that in order to know God, hence the term, you must sacrifice everything. You must let go of everything as a separate individual object. Now, technically, you're not really, if once you turn into God, you're not really surrendering it. All you're really doing is surrendering it as a separate object, separate from you, you see. Once you recognize that everything is within you, you can still continue to have those things, right? The only thing is, because that's very difficult to do, you see, that's very difficult, very challenging to disidentify with things while you're holding on to them, while you're giving attention to those things. How do you do that? That's why the first process is come back within yourself, and from there you can then realize that it's all out there. To make it another, another analogy, um, if you will consider that you are the sky, and that you are pretending to be like a cloud. All the different clouds have different shapes, different forms. But as long as you're, and you're always the sky, even when you're inside the cloud, pretending you're the shape of a dog or a cat or a person or whatever it is, you see, you're still the sky, you see, within the cloud that's between the water droplets, the moisture, the, the mist that makes up the cloud. The only way to know, you see, that you're the sky, is for your attention, your sense of self, to extend out beyond the cloud that you're in, that you believe you are. Once your awareness extends out beyond that, then you can look in on yourself as being a separate cloud and say, oh, that's not who I am. I've been the sky all along. See, the only way for that to occur, though, is to disidentify with the water droplets and become the space between them. And for that, one-pointed attention is necessary, and that's why self-inquiry. See, as soon as you give attention to the I thought, you have become very, very small. You know, you have become extremely small because, in fact, right on the cusp of becoming a nothing, because ultimately everything is I. But the I felt as a separate sense is attached to other thoughts. You are on the cusp. The sense of me that is felt within you, okay, um, that sense of I or me is really a not that creates a like a bridge between the sentient awareness that you really are and the insentient body and world that exists out there. So it's the me, the sense of me is like the bridge. So just to give you an example, right now, go ahead and point over at me, over here, up here. Okay, point it. Now point back to yourself. Now look, bring it all the way to your body, where you're pointing. Good. You were all pointing to the same place. None of you pointed to your head or your thigh. You pointed to your chest. Why? Because this is where the sense of me is felt within the body. This is the heart. This is the center. Now, you didn't point to the organ way over here on the left. You pointed to the center or slightly to the right, if anything. Now, if you were to go even into the Bible and you were to look up Ecclesiastes 10.2, it says, the wise man's heart is at the right hand, while the fool's heart is at the left. Hmm. And what is it talking about? It's talking about the center. The heart just means center. That's all the heart means. Okay. And so what this is doing is this is showing you where the world actually emerges. This whole thing is a dream. We talked about this a little earlier in our session. 
this whole thing is, is an illusion, it's a dream, it's not real, it's a thought. And it all is being projected out of the heart. Like a hologram. Mm -hmm. where the projector is in, is in the heart, is filled there. You see? And so the only way to really know that, you see, is not to believe what I'm telling you here. I'm a character in your dream. For a moment, just for an instant, pretend like you're just an image in my dream. While you're looking at me, pretend like you're just an image in my dream. What happens to the density of your body? Do you feel solid? When you consider that you're just an image in my dream? When you feel that you're an image in my dream? What happens? It's fluid. You see, for an instant, you stop thinking along the thought stream that you normally do, that you're a solid person. See, and this particular path, the reason why we have these every week, the reason why we join to get here is to bring your mind into a, a stillness so that your consciousness can enter into a state of receptivity to drink in these ideas. These seeds will plant in your consciousness and they will grow and connect with each other to create the ultimate understanding. Basically, what will bring you beyond the mind. You see. Not that it, it won't take you into beyond the mind, it will take you right up to the edge. It will, in a sense, create this understanding, this realization, which will make you realize that I can't possibly be that little teeny me that I've always thought I was. I must be the awareness that's behind it, that's aware of it. And that's the whole purpose of this. And that, this is called Gnana Yoga. Say that again. Gnana Yoga. Gnana Yoga. Yeah, J-N-A-N-A. -N -A. Some people call it Nana Yoga, but it's, yoga. it's the path of realization through direct insight. And so, in this particular path, it doesn't take lifetimes. It doesn't take decades for self-realization. It can be instantaneous. Some people, they say that when they start uh, meditation and do all this, this kind of, um, you know, different study, of, I should say, I don't, I don't know how can I refer to it. Mm -hmm. They say they start seeing all these lights and uh, all these things and uh, mm -hmm. what is it? Those are all the ego. Those are all It's the ego, right? Oh, yeah. All the, yeah, because if I don't see it, see, I don't know how come I don't see it. No. <laughs> okay. see, but, now, but now notice how the ego will create that as something to aspire to. Yeah. Seeing all these lights, or seeing all these deities, <laughs> or, or even seeing Jesus, and seeing Buddha, or whatever it is that you see, yeah. Mother Teresa, whatever you see, <laughs> okay, Mother Mary, whatever you're seeing, whatever the object is, it's a form. Right. But when you're in the peaceful stillness, the awareness, there are no forms. The deeper you plunge into the heart, the deeper you move into the black hole, the more blissful. Yeah. You see, you know, eventually what ends up happening is it's as peaceful and still as it is in deep sleep. And yet, you can still be awake and aware of the world. That is self -realization. Then it, it, it's, it's more like a state of being. Without thinking. Without thinking. It's not that you can't think, right? But there's no compulsive thinking. There's no constant thinking. Always thinking about something. Always having that ongoing sound in the back of your mind. That ongoing, see, this is the mind's strategy to keep the mind externalized toward the body. Whatever's going on in the body or even thoughts in your mind. Now, depending on the particular dream that is being projected out of the heart of the one infinite consciousness, you see, depending on how sophisticated it wants to get, you see, it's going to create obstacles that are on par or proportional 
with your capacity to realize who you are. The more sensitive you are, the more trauma you're probably going to need to experience while you're young. Um, to keep you locked in some kind of maze, to keep you from waking up too soon. Because that would prevent, that would, that would negate the purpose for even having the dream in the first place. Um, the whole idea for consciousness to, to get lost in the world of forms is so that it can experience form. Right. You see? So, you know, some people say, well, gosh, why can't we just be realized right off the bat? Well, you, you are, but then it's necessary to forget who you are so that you can get wrapped up in the drama, in the dream, in the play. See? It's not like God is saying, well, this is what you need to do. You need to get lost and confused in yourself. No. There isn't, God is not a separate individual that doesn't think like humans do. That's just one thought within the mind within the consciousness of the infinite or the divine. Just like one light beam coming out of the sun, that's just one of infinite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we then grab onto the idea that we're a separate individual and we say, oh, that's me. I'm this separate individual. I have my own individual life, which is just a thought. Because as soon as you stop thinking, when you fall asleep at night in deep sleep, there is no world. Yeah. There is no world. It's an illusion. You see, and, and just to show you, if you've ever woken up from a dream suddenly, you will notice that you could have been, let's just say, a different person or an animal or whatever it is you were in your dream, right? And there were cities there. Mm -hmm. Sidewalks, trees, buildings, people, right? That took years to build or years to grow, and yet you've only been asleep for what, a couple hours? And, yeah. and yet they managed to be there. How can they be there if they're real? And yet you say, well, yeah, but that's in my dream. Well, yeah, but when you're in your dream, they're not in your dream, they're your reality. And then when you come back to this one, you, you convince yourself that that was dream and that this is the real, the real world, this is the reality. But really all you're doing is you're just jumping from one dream state to another. You call one the waking state and one the dream state. This is what the movie Matrix is all about. It's, it's consciousness trying to remind itself that it's in a dream. Wake up, Jesus said. What does he say? Wake up, he that sleepeth. Wake up to the reality of who you are. John 10, 34. Ye are gods. The kingdom of God is within you. I mean, you can't, you can't. If he would have been any more direct, you know, he wouldn't have stuck around very long. Back in those days, if you say these kinds of things, you know, according to the, to the story, the dream, you know, that's blasphemy. Yeah, that's true. So you can't, yeah. it's not like today where you can just write a book about it. Yeah. You know, back in those days, you had to be really careful how you said things. You know, they're ready to pick up stones and that was... So, you know, it, but there's been a progression in consciousness toward that state, that evolution of, of awakening to itself. Now, it appears that you as a separate individual are awakening to the truth, that you're God. But really, once the awakening occurs, once you're in that state, you realize there is no individual. There never was. Once you fall out of the sponge into the ocean, you realize there was always just the ocean. And yet, you're saying it through the body of the sponge. So the other sponges that haven't fallen out of it yet, you see, even though they're still the same ocean, they can't understand how you can say that you're the entire ocean. Because you're still the same ocean talking to itself. Yeah. Do we, do we get this? It's a little bit to wrap your, your you know, you're nogging around.
in one shot, but do you get the general idea? Now this this is where this is where repeated contemplation. Now I'll tell you we, we have people who come here. You know uh, this is not packed. Of course we have Friday night we have. Um, well, and right now three people usually come here out of town. Yeah. So and and we have and Friday night we have uh, potluck. You know this week, right? Oh yeah. So a lot. You know, but we don't have. We even so we have not had huge numbers of people who've been able to stick with it. They start to contemplate it. They turn inward. They practice the self-inquiry. And a couple months later, the mind creates a story to pull them away. They'll get jobs where they have to work on Tuesday or Friday night or all these different circumstances. You know, their, their friends will want them to go out. That's why generally most people who turn inward on the spiritual path, the true devotees of, of the divine, they really have gotten to a point where they recognize that there, there's nothing in the world that will ever satisfy them. That there's only one thing that can satisfy them, and it's not a thing. It's being it's that state. To know who they are. To, to abide in the heart, in the bliss, the love of the divine. And that, that really can only come once you let go of those things in the world. And, you know, of course the ego will try to create or invent all types of paths, spiritual paths, that say that you can, you know, go out and use your mind to get all the things that you want to do, manifest all these different things and stuff. But that's just, those are just all egoic strategies to pull the mind outward. And so the key is, no matter what it is that you're doing, if you are going to do it, fine. Just remember yourself in the process. You know? yeah. So whatever you're because, doing. Because I think maybe people, they don't stay. It's not because they don't want to stay. Well, I don't know. You can, be in that state of bliss, you can manifest anything you, you, you want. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying there's no limit at that point. That you can manifest just like that. But remember... But people then don't think they do. So they well, think they have they to go won't. back to the work or... The well, family. they won't feel right. that they want to. See, when you... The only reason why you want to manifest something or bring something about when you think you're separate is because you think that that's not what you are. Mm -hmm. There's no need to try to create something you already are. Right. So as long as you think you're a separate individual, then trying to create all these things outside of you sounds very appealing. But once you realize you're the entire ocean and that it all exists within you anyway, where's the desire to create anything? Once you realize you're already the ocean and it's all inside you. Yeah, I it's understand. Like, well, it's yeah. like trying to create a fingernail on your hand. Why would you try to create a fingernail on your hand? If I already have one. Yes. That's the same mentality. Once you realize it's all in you and you're abiding in the bliss. But then um, if you, you get to that point, why are you here anyway? Well, right? why, well, why you were here and why you are here now is different. See, it's important to become confused and lost in the illusion before you wake up. In other words, if you were always the ocean, right? Mm -hmm. And all you were ever aware of was the ocean, right? You wouldn't be aware of anything, so you wouldn't know that you're in the entire ocean. Mm -hmm. So the sponge makes you... So you forget you're the ocean and pretend you're the sponge so that you can use the sponge to contrast you see, your formless self with mm -hmm. your form. That contrast, that using that as a, in other words, this is what I thought I was, now this is what I am. You're using objects in order to create a sense of self. So yeah, you can perceive it. Because, yeah, I think that's like, a, I know that I have, I'm like a glass, a, a 
glasses, right? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the the glass or oh, where is it that I can I don't know. I don't know where. Um, but I'm aware that there is the glass. There is a glass here because I am here. You, if I wouldn't be here, yes. and the glass will still be here. But nobody would be aware that the, the, the existence of the glass. So Is that they, what you're saying? So then would they exist? Yeah, so that they, they become into existence. They wouldn't exist as that right. they would physically. They would become nominal. In other words, they would become non-physical at that state. They're only existing as a physical solid thing because you think that they're there. Mm -hmm. You can exist without the glasses, but they cannot exist without you. Right, that's it. yeah. So that's what you say. That the ocean needs the sponge. So can he, the ocean itself can yeah. become aware of his own existence. Yes. Is that what you say? Yes. No. They are independent on one. Are interdependent on one another. The form, you see, you see, is only exists because of the formless ocean. Mm -hmm. The formless ocean can only know itself because of the forms. Therefore, the combined forms and formlessness comprise infinity. There is the reason for the existence, for God to know itself, hence the term self-realization. Right. So, right. So, you see? He, so, so God knows himself to us. To this illusion that he makes of us. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, well put. Well put. Worded. And and it's it's very subtle. Yeah. But to make that adjustment, is, demonstrates an understanding of it. You cannot. You cannot think that you're God. You yeah. must know that you're God. Right. Hence the statement: "Be still and know that I am God." That. That comes from that realization. It cannot be a conceptual uh, idea. There's a lot of, you know, appearance at least, a lot of people running around saying, I am God, I am God, I am a creator, I am a co-creator, I am a manifester, and all this stuff. Right. But the real, once you know you're the formless awareness, anything that gets created or done is not being done by you as a separate individual. It's being manifest by the infinite ocean. Right. Um, you see the collective unconscious. The collective consciousness. The collective consciousness. Yeah. The one. Yeah. So now, now the way to be aware uh, of that awareness, if you close your eyes for a moment, notice how your awareness goes out in all directions. Notice that your awareness goes out infinitely in front of you. It just keeps going. There is no boundary to your awareness. Now you're not trying to make your awareness infinite. It just is. But you'll notice that no matter how many objects are 10 feet away from you, 6 feet away from you, your awareness goes on infinitely. Because your awareness is more subtle than form. The only time that objects appear solid is when you introduce the senses. You see, when you use the body, right now you have eliminated your sense of vision. Mm -hmm. By eliminating 90% of your sensory input, it's not solid. Yeah. You have to give attention to the senses in order to perceive the world. This is what a magnificent instrument your body is. God can know itself to be infinite at the same time with a blink of an eye, to be finite. To be a restricted, separate individual. That's how magnificent it is. That's how, and once you recognize the magnificence of that, you see, then there's no need really for anything at that point. You know that, you know, you're okay, no matter what. No matter what happens. 
in, from an individualistic standpoint, from an individuated perspective, you will want nothing but to serve God, but to serve your body. In other words, the sponge wants to do nothing but to serve the ocean. Not that the sponge itself has any particular desires, you know, because all the desires are really the ocean within the sponge. It just appears that the sponge, the sponge is insentient. Your body is inert. It has no life whatsoever. It's only the arrangement of the ocean in the shape of the sponge. It would probably be more accurate to take it to the next step beyond that, the next level of understanding, to say that your body is like an ice sculpture floating in the ocean. Hmm. See, your entire your body is made out of the ocean, even if it seems to be solid. It's still just made out of the water. And so in this way, the intelligence allows for it to appear solid so that it can create this apparent empty space between us to sustain the illusion of separateness, of fear, insecurity, comparison, and duality. You see, and every night we go to sleep, just before we fall asleep or right when we wake up, we have a glimpse. As the world begins to emerge. And the more deeply you are able, the more frequently you practice the self-inquiry, you can create those glimpses all day long. As you're turning your attention. Now it takes time. It takes, well, paradoxically, it takes practice. It takes a little bit of time to, for that conditioning to reverse. The mind has been going this way, this way, this way, and now to consciously withdraw into the heart, that requires, you know, going contrary to everything you probably have learned. Even our religions are all part of the duality, they're all part of the egoic tactic or ploy to keep the mind, to keep us stuck in the world of duality. That's true. <clears throat> the, the, the angels and the, the evil. <laughs> yeah. All the good the, and the evil. Yes. Yeah. Mm. They're all on the level of form. They're all they yeah. all exist on that level. Yeah. Beautiful, nice. Mm, that yeah. is true. So, but we do have the light and the, the darkness. Mm -hmm. I mean the night and the day. And they exist where? In the universe. In your mind. In my mind. They're still just thoughts. They're polarities. All dualities exist in the world of duality. So we perceive them yes. as duality. But they only one. But they're one. They're all one and the same. Hmm. Yeah. So you see, and it's kind of an interesting thing if you've ever considered this, but of all the thoughts that you have, every single thought you have that's experiential, yeah. every thought you have has an opposite. An opposite? An opposite. A polarity. Huh. Try to think of something that doesn't have a polarity. Interesting. Illness? Illness? What? Illness. Illness. Uh, disease. Oh, oh, illness. Okay. Health. Yeah. Okay. You could say, okay, what's the opposite of a dog? Right? It's not a cat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the opposite of a dog would be not dog. No, no. A non-dog. Anything that's not a dog would be the opposite of a dog. It's a polarity. Oh, the opposite of a man. No, a man. A human being. You could say that, yeah, exactly. The opposite of a human would be whatever's not human. Because it is perceiving it. Therefore, there's a subject-object. 
So, in other words, you could put the word not. Now, let's take that back to I am. Right? Mm -hmm. I am not. Now, that's the only, the only thing that does not have an experiential opposite. Because if you were not, you could not experience anything. Hmm. Hmm. You can't even negate it, the I am. To negate